Big Eva Christianity, I believe, is the state religion. Um, now, it's not state-sponsored necessarily, but it's, it's the standard conformity religion. Hey everybody, welcome to Contra Thoughts. My name is Richard, and we've got some more madness at McLean Bible Church. Coming up next. Horse, I was yelling at people all weekend. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <clears throat> a little congested. Feeling good though, in case you were wondering. We've got some interesting things at McLean Bible Church. Once again, this is the pastor, uh, David Platt. He's the main pastor. It's thousands of people, although they're hemorrhaging people apparently left and right. Uh, the church has been sued by the church, uh, the elders have been sued by the church, and uh, this was about a year and a half ago, another guy with more melanin talked about torching white people. Of course, I think he was just kind of, you know, street lingo for bothering, hazing, uh, roasting, as it were. You know, you set somebody up and you roast them, you make fun of them. But this is also the same David Platt and this church that was closed in June and July, or at least in June of 2020, and yet went to BLM rallies. Right? Closed for the pandemic, but went to BLM rallies, you know, for support. And air quotes all over the place. And I, the point is they're not being faithful. The point is they're being, they're having another um, boss, another god. There's somebody else in charge. And it's quite evident. Uh, maybe they don't know that, maybe not everybody at the church knows that, but standing from afar, again, that's my very inexperienced, uh, but nevertheless, uh, my opinion. Because there's too many things now that are happening uh, that just do not make sense. That a Bible church, or church in general, but you know, all churches should be Bible church, I get it. Um, but a church should not exhibit, yet they do. There's a clip here, you might have already seen it. We're just gonna walk through it briefly. This is from a Doctrinal Watchdog. It's been on a number of different things. And it's a recording of a recording, right? So let me just play this and we'll see. Hey, what's going on? My name is Aaron Saunders and I'm a pastor here at McLean Bible. And my question today is this, how do I love my transgender neighbor? See, Jesus is the ultimate hope. And in Jesus, our transgender neighbors find a friend closer than anyone else. You see, we have a God who has not left us alone. We have a Savior, Jesus, who has experienced the ultimate feeling of not belonging in his body. 1 Peter 2.24 says this about Jesus. It says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Uh, I want you to think about this. Jesus, the sinless and holy Son of God, perfect in all of his ways, he bore our sins in his body. And in doing this, listen, Jesus experienced something completely foreign to his, to his understanding of who he is. What did he experience? The holy Son of God experienced sin in that moment. You could say in that moment that he experienced a kind of... So here's the thing. Here's the thing with new, fancy, fun Christianity, big Eva Christianity. Big Eva Christianity, I believe, is the state religion. Um, now, it's not state-sponsored necessarily, but it's it's the standard conformity religion, right? Big churches, clear pulpits, no pulpits, cool, cool kid clothes, fancy sneakers, really relevant talking words, right? Things that they would say today they wouldn't have said 10 or 20 years ago. Now, this is different than 100 years ago within the mainline establishment churches and 150 years ago within you know the English churches or something like that. Um, but nevertheless, there's always been a quote-unquote state church, a normal mainline church. 300 years ago, it was um, Anglicanism and you know the Baptists and the Presbyterians and other stuff were rabble rousers, especially the Baptists. That's why I'm one of the reasons why I'm still a Baptist. I don't know what this is. This looks like some sort of online learning thing. And it's like, it's good so far. You're like, okay, yeah. I mean, this, you know, he's super, you know, super cool looking. He's, hey, McLean Bible, blah, blah, blah. He doesn't just say McLean, he says McLean Bible. You can know a lot by a church, right? What's going on by the name? I'm always wary of, you know, um, McLean Christian Center or something. It's like, Center? 
I mean, fellowship is, yeah, it's a little bit better, but anyway. It's a Bible church, right? And so he quotes the Bible. Now, he's tracking, and then all of a sudden he's like, yeah, he, he experienced body dysphoria. I'm sorry, what? Where does it say that? He quotes 1 Peter 2, right? Quotes 1 Peter 2. For he himself bore our sins on in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Okay. And so how can I share my the gospel with my transgender neighbor? Well, the same way you would share the gospel, proclaim it, I would prefer that lingo than sharing. It's not like it's a cookie and you, hey, here you go, have a cookie. Like you would everybody else. Now, I understand there's contextual things. I understand you might have to say, so your name's Tiffany. It used to be David. Tell me about your life. Tell me about whatever. Did you grow up in the church? Do you have any sort of religion? Or what's your religion? Or what do you believe? Or who's Jesus to you? Something like that, right? And then you would call them out of darkness into light, just like Christ calls every person out. Now, here's the thing, and there's it's from a Reformation Charlotte post, and uh, talks about uh, Preston Sprinkle. He's got a doctorate, by the way, so he would be Dr. Sprinkle, or maybe it's Sprinkles. I mean, you might as well be called Mr. Rainbow and, you know, Mrs. Sunshine or something. Anyway, all the sunshine's not that bad. <laughs> anyway, that's with the revoice conference and, you know, basically gay Christianity and celibate, you know, one-on-one -on -one or, yeah, one-on-one -on -one marriage style. Like, there's just this whole mess. I'm not talking about that. I just want to talk about this video. That's all bad in and of itself. Not good. Don't support Revoice. It is uh, mixing clay and iron. It's, it's, it's false. It's not going to work. It's a third way middle ground that will not hold. Don't do it. But, for this particular man. You're tracking, you're tracking, you're like, okay. But body dysphoria. Well, again, body dysphoria, where is that in the text? It's nowhere in the text. He cites 1 Peter 2. Great, love 1 Peter, one of my favorites. Um, but what what 1 Peter also says, what Peter, 1, 1 Peter also says, is all flesh is like grass, the glory of the flower of the grass. The grass withers, the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord remains forever. So, He's saying, hey, this is cool, this is design, this is wonderful and beautiful, the glory of it, but it's going to die. God's word will not die. So we should adhere to God's word. That's the implication there. Before that, in chapter 1, therefore, preparing your minds. Listen to this, ladies and gentlemen. This is where we need to take up arms with our words, with our actions, not Physically, I'm not saying that, not violence, not at all. What I'm saying is we take every thought captive. Listen to that language. We are at war. And we've been at war since Genesis 3, but so often, and especially in the last 80 to 100 years, we've been very cushy. My generation, your generation, I don't care who's watching this, all of our generations have been very just hypnotized into a slumber. Preparing your minds for action. Listen to that. Preparing your minds for action. Being sober-minded. Set your hope fully. Listen to this. I mean, again, this is where personal responsibility and the level of actual responsibility that gets levied back on the Christian. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, oh, Jesus doesn't care about what I do. He doesn't care about this. He doesn't care about that. Not true. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. The former ignorance. Your former ignorance. Don't be conformed. To, don't look back and say, oh, man, yeah, I'm, I'm a gay Christian. I'm a trans Christian. I'm a progressive Christian. I'm a whatever Christian. I don't even like the term evangelical. It's stupid. I mean, again, I understand why we have some of these things. Because people co-opt these things. It wasn't enough to say you were a follower of Christ. You had to be a Protestant. It can't be a Protestant. You have to be an evangelical Protestant or an Orthodox Protestant or, you know, a fundamentalist Protestant. Oh, no, no, no. 
Can we just get back to being a follower of Christ? And if you're not a follower of Christ by your life and by your words, by what you believe, you're not a Christian. You don't need to put all these nomenclatures in front of it, all these qualifiers. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct. So your transgender neighbor, I, I assume he's talking about prior uh, to coming to Christ. But what is so often the case, especially with Revoice, which this article talks about, is the fact that Revoice says, oh, no, no, you're fine the way you are. It's just kind of, you know, you need a little bit of Jesus sauce on top, but you're good otherwise. You're good otherwise. You can be same-sex attracted and just don't act on it. Now, there's still debate on whether same-sex attraction is the sin or the action is the sin. I'm not getting into that here. Uh, but I would say, as a straight, white, cisgender, male, blah, 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 if I'm attracted to redheads, tall gals, shorter gals, blondes, brunettes, does that mean I get four or five wives because I'm attracted to all them? No. So, is the attraction sinful? I would lean no, at least for somebody who's straight, obviously being a homosexual. The Bible doesn't really talk about attraction. It talks about action. But again, that's another video. The point is, these people in Revoice are saying, oh, it's fine. You can just live celibate lives. Really? No. No, you can't. No. It's very incredibly unwise. And further still, it's actually sin because he talks about your prior conduct, your prior life, your don't be conformed to that old way. Don't go back into your anger. I've struggled with anger. I've struggled with lust in the past. Many of us men, and you know, nobody really talks about it nearly as much as we should, have struggled with pornography for, for years. Pornography use, by the way. I prefer that term versus looking. It's actually use because it's more like a drug. Some people are addicted to heroin, methamphetamines, all sorts of other crazy things. Alcohol, you name it. Th thieving. You know, people are kleptomaniacs, right? They steal stuff just left and right. They lie all the time. You're not going to be, oh, I'm a, I'm, I'm a lying Christian. I'm a drunkard Christian. Really? I mean, I say that and we all think, <laughs> of course, it's ridiculous. Who would do that? But I'm a gay Christian. I'm a trans Christian. I'm a progressive Christian. No, no qualifiers. None. But as he called you, who is holy? He is holy. We should be holy. As Christians, we should be holy. Not, And that's holy, not just like flawless and set apart or flawless, it is meaning particularly set apart. Not to say that God isn't flawless, not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is God is set apart. Even the Holy Bible is a set apart book. That's what it means, Bible, book, book, Bible. And so we see these things, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Do we believe that, church? And if you're a Christian, do you act on it? And if you're not a Christian, you can turn to Jesus. You can, and somebody who might be watching this who's trans. You're not your flesh, ultimately. Either you're a worshiper of Christ and a slave of him, or you're not, and you're rebelling against him. There's two options, that's it. So melanin, less melanin, more tall, short, fat, skinny, muscular, athletic, you know, whatever, anorexic, I don't know. But there's all these other qualifiers we don't have with other things. And yet somehow this whole topic, we talk about this body dysphoria. And to say then, oh yeah, Jesus experienced body dysphoria. No, he didn't. Because what he did was, John 1, he became flesh. He added humanity to himself. So there was a point in eternity past, Jesus did not have a body. And then in the past, in our timeline, he added flesh. And then he resurrected, not just as a spirit, that's all heresy, where, you know, Jesus was a spirit, he didn't have a body, or he was God, you know, but he was kind of a manifestation, or he had a body, but he wasn't God. And there's all these, you know, early Gnostic uh, heretics and heresies that go on, you know, who Jesus was. He was fully God. He was fully man. He was God in a body. But not just God in a body, but God with a body, adding to himself. So to experience any sort of body dysphoria is a lie. And not to mention the fact is, I mean, again, I would call this false teaching. I wouldn't call this necessarily heresy because I qualify heresy as both false teaching and false teaching seeking to divide. That's where I would say that false heresy is really 
rooted. That's what it is. That's twofold, not just one. Because sometimes you say, you missay, you mistake stuff, you missay stuff, um, or you're, you just have a bad theology, theology about something. The point is, this verse has nothing to do with this. Nothing. Nothing at all. Absolutely nothing. And there's no other verse other than him saying you know, he experienced it, you know, uh, flesh, in his flesh, sin for us. Well, that means that our flesh needs to be crucified. In fact, oh man, it just popped into my head because it's just how the Spirit works, I guess. Hebrews... Hebrews 12, 4. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you might not grow weary or faint-hearted. Oh, church. Oh, family, that is so good. Those who are watching, many of you are Christians. I don't think everybody. Read Hebrews today. If you need something to read, you're not sure, you're still on the fence, you're, uh, who this Jesus character is. That's what Christianity is all about. It's about Jesus. It's not about just going to church. It's not about being good. It's not about being holy. It's not about some other thing. It's about Christ. And we do things because he has purchased us, because he loves us, because of the relationship we have towards him. While we were still sinners, Jesus died for us, Romans 5 tells us. While we were still sinners, while you were still trans, gay, an adulterer, a fornicator, a drunkard, a tax collector. He died for you. You don't have to be good enough. Every other religion says, you know, you got to clean up your act. Once you clean up your act, then you'll be able to kind of, you know, you'll be able to kind of be on the outer parts and then we'll slowly, gradually come in based on how much money you give us, based on, you know, your external actions. So consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself. This is Hebrews 12, 3. So that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Listen to this. This is just, and we'll end with this. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your own blood. In your struggle against sin, if you shed your own blood, I haven't. Not even close. And I highly, highly doubt you have either. We are too soft on sin. We are too soft in the church in general. Church discipline pretty much doesn't happen. Personal holiness is nil, looking exactly like the world. And so the church, and churches just like McLean Bible Church, will go in and start to manipulate and change and squish, kind of like this, you know, the jello mold at Thanksgiving that just sits there and might look good and it might taste, and you're like, you know, let's be real here. I mean, you only want a few bites of jello anyway, unless you're weird. And so, but it's, they put all sorts of weird stuff. I was just talking. Christmas, like thank, like peas and like carrots and just all sorts of weird stuff and jello. Don't do that. Don't even, don't. Stop. Just stop. But that's what these churches are like. They're just jello molds. And they sit there, or candy, cotton candy, right? They just, they might look good. They might be tasty for a little bit, but there's zero foundation. He, he cites one verse that has nothing to do with body dysphoria. Jesus did not experience body dysphoria. He added humanity to himself. Massive difference. So to say this, and the, and the thing is, Again, they're saying this because they want, it seems, to have people remain in their trans identity. Well, you're a trans Christian. Or to say you can't really change. Or, and or, it's also basically just to say that these people need to be identified. They need to be empathetic. And Jesus will be empathetic towards you. Jesus experienced, yes, many things for us. He didn't experience... Uh, necessarily being married, not in the you know classical sense. So does that mean he has nothing to say to men and women about marriage? No, of course not. He didn't experience killing a man. He didn't experience you know all sorts of other heinous crimes and sins. Did he? No. Did he experience being a woman? Did he, I mean on and on and on? So this whole lie about oh you need to experience it. We need to hear the voices. This is the whole argument. You know different people at the table and you know different voices. No, we need the voice of God. That's what we need. And that's found in the scripture. Flat out, nowhere else. And that should take, we should take great comfort in that. Not spurn that, not push that away, but take comfort in it. So again, I hope you found this helpful. Please like and subscribe if you haven't. I know I've got a lot of new subscribers lately, so thank you so much uh, for coming. Um, this is Contra Thoughts. This is, you know, kind of, I'll talk off, um, you know, either mini, they're almost just like a sermonette with a certain topic, whether it's culture or church or, you know, political thing or something like that. 
Uh, I've got Contra Talk where I talk about other things uh, that are a little bit more long form, usually with another uh, person. Usually, I think they've only been guys at this point, but I've got a couple coming up as well. Uh, hoping to talk to a few more um, bigger names, as it were. And uh, yeah, I did a top 10 recently of books for top uh, 2022. You should check that out as well. So please like, please subscribe, please share. If you haven't already, I'd really appreciate it. Uh, it does help the algorithm push it out to more people. The more you interact, drop a comment, all that other stuff, do all the youtube -y things, it tells YouTube, hey, yeah, these people like this video, and uh, or at least they are interacting with this video, and it helps get the message because that's ultimately the goal. Jesus has overcome the world, right? There's problems. He says you're going to have tribulation, and that's what being contra mundum against the world, but for it, for the world, pro mundo, because Jesus has overcome it. Because like you, I was once in the world, and somebody called you. Somebody shared the gospel, proclaimed it to you. Somebody shared a book. Somebody gave you a tract. Somebody prayed with you. Somebody did something and said, listen, the way you're doing your life isn't right. Even if you were five years old or 55, doesn't matter. So, hope you found this helpful. Have a good day. We'll see you next time.